have you, any of you guys ever done the horrible, horrible game of Bible roulette where you ask the Lord to speak to you? Take a Bible. You say, Lord, speak to me. And you just open it and point your finger. Anybody done this before? Yes. Terrible, terrible, terrible idea. You know why? <laughs> Because there are some weird scripture verses in the Bible, okay? Weird, some weird. Like, you'd be, I'd be like, Lord, speak to me. And you end up on like 2 Kings 2.22, and it's like, Elisha went up to Bethel. And it's like, and there were some kids that came out of the woods, and they were like, go up, bald head, go up, bald head. And it was like, and Elijah cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the forest and tore the 42 children to pieces. He's like, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Okay, so, or you could end up, um, you're like turning the Bible, you're like, Lord, speak to me. And you point, you end up in the middle, like in Psalms, you know, I, and you could end up on Psalm 38. And I had a friend who was signing a book. And in the moment, he couldn't remember if he normally signed the book Psalms 138.8 or Psalms 38.8. Because Psalms 138.8 says, it's good, it says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Awesome, great. But in the moment, he thought it was Psalms 38.8. And that poor woman, she went home. I'm not, oh, it's not scripture. Oh, I'm going to go read Psalms 38.8. What does it say? She opens the Bible and says, my loins burn with fever for you. It's like my flesh has been afflicted. It's like, sounds like you need a cream for that. Okay, so. Well, <laughs> I remember right out of college, I was a youth minister. I'm from Southern California. I'm from Orange County, California. And I, yeah, woo, woo. Um, and I was a youth minister in a little town called Ventura, California, which is Santa Barbara area. And I remember sitting on my bed, I'm 21 or 22, and I have this ache in my heart. And I'm thinking, this ache is for a husband. And I'm like, Lord, I'm praying like, Lord, you are the Lord of the universe. You can bring my future husband whenever you want. Wink, wink, bring him now, you know? I have this ache and this longing in my heart. Um, and I totally did Bible roulette. And I'm like, Lord, speak to me. And thank God I didn't end up on Psalm 38. It's like, your loins burn with fever. I'm like, they do, they do. Okay, you know, I didn't end there. Thankfully, I ended up on a good psalm, Psalm 63, which is one of my favorite psalms in the Bible. And actually, anyone who's a, a, a religious, a priest, a nun, they pray the liturgy of the hours. And this psalm comes up a lot, and it says this. Oh God, you are my God. For you, I long. For you, my body yearns. For you, my soul thirsts like a lamb that is parched lifeless and without water. So I look to you in the sanctuary to see your power and glory for your love is better than life. And in that moment, I realized this ache in my heart, this loneliness in my heart was not for a husband. It was for God. And every time you or I feel that ache in our hearts, it's not for more money, for more popularity, more stardom, success, power, honor. That ache in your heart is God knocking on your heart saying, it's me that you long for. Because there's nothing in this world that's going to satisfy your heart. No human being, no amount of money, power, success sex, drink, whatever it is, no, nothing, no drug. It's all been done and tried. The only thing that can satisfy that ache of the heart is God. And in fact, I am married. I was 28 when I got married. I waited for the man of my dreams. I waited till marriage to have sex. I waited when I was 18. I started praying for my future husband and I waited. And guess what? My husband is a, he's a fine man. Okay. He is, he is good looking and he is a holy man. He is, oh my goodness. He is hot and holy. Um, <sighs> My husband is my best friend. And my favorite definition of marriage, that marriage is friendship with romance. My husband is my best friend and he leads me to Jesus. But guess what? My husband is not God. And neither am I. And even in marriage, even, if, even with a man of my dreams, there's still that ache in my heart because God is reminding me, Jackie, no human being is going to satisfy every single desire of your heart. Only I can do that. And I'm like, you're right, God. And even on my wedding day, as Bobby and I, I mean, his, he, my husband's name is even dreamy. His name is Bobby Angel. Come on. You know what I mean? Um, Bobby Angel, yes, I love you. Okay, so even on our wedding day, 
My husband and I, as we knelt down before Jesus in the Eucharist at Mass, at our wedding Mass, I remember looking at Jesus, and when I was 18, I fell in love with Jesus. He became the love of my life. I was actually at a Steubenville Youth Conference 20 years ago. This is my anniversary of my conversion in my Catholic faith. 20 years ago, yeah. And for me, back then it was called Young Apostles, now it's called Lead. That week changed my life and it has never been the same again. 20 years ago, I fell in love with Jesus and on my wedding day, (laughs) I looked at Jesus in the Eucharist and I said, Jesus, you are my bridegroom and this here, my Bobby, he's the best man. Because Bobby and I got married knowing that we both need to make sure we love God more than anything else, even more than each other. And I prayed for a man that loved Jesus more than he loved me. Because only in loving Jesus more than he loves me is he going to know how to actually treat me. Amen? That's right. And so here's the deal. We've been going to Genesis. The last couple talks we've heard about Genesis going back to the beginning. And why do we go back to the beginning? Because in the beginning we see that man and woman created in the image and likeness of God were made out of love for love. Every single one of us were made for love. We know in the ache of our hearts every human being on this planet, whether you are Catholic or Muslim or Buddhist or Jewish or Hindu or atheist, every single person was made in the image and likeness of God who is love. That's why every single person knows they were made for two things. They were made to love and to be loved. It doesn't matter what religion you are. I studied world religions. That was my major. I have a high respect for people of other religions. But I know every person in their heart desires love. And we were made in the image and likeness of God, who is love. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, God is love. Well, guess what? You and I were made in the image and likeness of God, who is love, which means you and I were made in the image and likeness of love. Well, how do we see this? Even in our bodies, as male and female, stamped in our bodies is the Trinity. Now, every analogy will always fall short of the Trinity, but Fulton Sheen, who was my favorite, he's like one of my spiritual grandpas, he's venerable Fulton Sheen on his way to sainthood, Fulton Sheen said, just in the Trinity, the Trinity is not a solitude, the Trinity is a communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? Fulton Sheen said the greatest analogy in the Bible of God's love for his people is that of a husband for his bride, a bridegroom for his bride is the most used analogy in the Bible to show God's love for his people. And guess what? A husband, just just as in the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Father loves his Son, Jesus Christ, so much. Jesus receives that love, and the love between them begets the Holy Spirit, another person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Well, Fulton Sheen said, just as a husband loves his wife, and the wife receives that love. We are made in the image and likeness of Trinity, and the wife receives that love, and the love between them is so powerful That nine months later, you got to name it, right? Nine months later, we are made in the image and likeness of the Trinity as male and female. We see that in love, there always has to be a lover, a beloved, and the love between them. And God the Father is like the lover. Jesus Christ is like the beloved son. And the love between them is the Holy Spirit. In fact, that was the reading from the the mass yesterday. On Friday, we read that the Holy Spirit is the love of God poured out into our hearts. You guys, we were made for love, and every single one of you, your whole lives, you will search for love. In fact, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in one of the very beginning paragraphs, paragraph 27, it says that our whole lives, we will look for truth and happiness, and we will never stop searching for that truth and happiness. Some of you, I mean, I hope none of you, I hope this talk changes something in your life. It shifts something in your life that you don't have to go look for drugs to be happy. I hope that you don't have to have hookup after hookup after hookup and still be miserable because you know that only God alone can satisfy that ache of your heart. I hope that you guys don't settle for this stuff. But I know, even I know in myself, I'm human. And I fall and I'm not perfect. And guess what? This goes back to the beginning in the garden. Matt shared last night how Adam was roaming around the garden looking for someone to love. And I come from a very musical family. My family's like the Von Trapp family. We sing the birthday song in three-part harmony. You know what I'm saying? And I always have a song going through my head. Any of you like that? You always have a song in your head? Yeah, for me. So like I imagine Adam's in the garden and he's looking for someone to love. And he's like, each morning I get up, I die a little. Can barely stand on my feet. You know, he's like, find me some, or you just think of Justin Bieber. I just need somebody to love. 
love, you know. And Adam's walking around. Oh, there you go. And Adam's looking around for someone to love. And I just think it's so funny because it's like, and he searched around at the animals to find a suitable partner. You know, it's like, I think that's illegal. Um, okay, so Adam like goes around. He's like, hey, giraffe, would you want to cuddle with me? And the giraffe's like, <laughs> like, no. You know, actually, I don't even know what a giraffe says. But um, he's like looking. And God says, it is not good for man to be alone. You guys, do you know, we were not meant to be alone. No human being was meant to be alone. God made us to be a gift. That doesn't mean every person is going to be married. It means that we are all called to be a gift of self in our relationships, in our friendships, in our romantic relationships, all the priests and the nuns in this room, all the deacons, people who have taken vows of celibacy, they aren't married. They're married to Jesus. The nuns are married to Jesus. The, the priests are married to the, the bride, the church, and they are called to be a gift. You and I are called to be a gift of self. We are called to lay down our lives for the other. You know what that's what love is? Love is not just about a feeling. Love is not about feeling. In fact, that's why we make vows on our wedding day. We say, I promise to love you till death do us part. I didn't, I didn't say to my husband, hey baby, I promise to love you until you get old and fat and ugly. And then I'm gonna find somebody else. You know, I didn't say that. Because that would be conditional love. But my husband and I made unconditional promises based on God's unconditional agape love. Saying, I will love you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And I'm gonna be really honest with you guys. In the garden, <laughs> We all know the story in the garden, what happened, that they were tempted, that the serpent was also in the garden and tempted Eve. And she took the fruit of the tree that she knew she shouldn't eat, and then she gave it to her husband. And guess what? Adam wasn't far away. He was right there with her, and he didn't protect her either. He could have protected her from the serpent, but they both failed. And sin came into the world. And I want to be really honest with you right now. I did not come from a good family in the sense that when I had my conversion at 18, I did not want to marry a man like my father. And I didn't want a marriage like my parents. And I know there are some of you in this room right now that you, your home life sucks. And your parents are divorced. Maybe somebody, mom or dad, left when you were young. And you don't want to repeat that, mis those, that marriage either. And I want you to know right now <laughs> that you don't have to. Repeat after me. I don't have to repeat the mistakes of my parents. Repeat after me. My past does not define my future. In my family, in my external family, just to be very honest with you, you know what I have? <laughs> I have divorce, adultery, rape, abuse, addiction, alcoholism, and guess what? That crap cycles over, that's called sin, and sin cycles generation after generation after generation until somebody stops it. Are you going to be the person that stops it? Are you going to be the person in your family that stops the abuse? Are you going to be the person in your family that stops the addiction? Are you going to be the person in your family that stops the divorce? When I was 18 and I fell in love with Jesus, I said, no more no more. And I said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? amen? You guys, amen. And it's all through Jesus. I can't do this on my own. I have never been able to do it on my own, ever. Now, maybe eighth grade Jackie, I thought I, I could do it all on my own. When I was in eighth grade, I made a vow to myself that I would never get drunk. I would never do drugs and I would wait till marriage to have sex. And guess what? People made fun of me. Yeah, right, Jackie. Like, you're never going to get drunk. Come on. And they made fun of me. And guess what? At this point, I hadn't had my conversion yet. I had started going to youth group. And I just thought it was all my willpower. And yeah, sure, in high school, I never got drunk. And actually, now to this day, I, can, I am 38 years old. I have never been drunk. And I waited till marriage to have sex. I want to tell you that because it is possible. <laughs> and 
And I, 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 first of all, I only say that because I want you to know it's possible. The world will tell you, yeah, right. The world's going to mock you for your decisions. The world will say it is not possible. In fact, the world is going to want you to want to see you fail. Amen. And guess who wants you to fail? The devil wants you to fail. You know why? Because the devil hates you. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to spend all eternity with you in heaven. In fact, male and female, the marriage between male and female is actually that love between a husband and wife is just supposed to be a foretaste of heaven, the wedding feast of heaven, the love between Jesus Christ, the bridegroom and his church, the bride in heaven. You know, heaven is a wedding feast. Heaven is eternal. Get this ecstasy. You're like, say what now? I want to go there. Okay. It said, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Do you know in this world, we will have sickness, pain, cancer, suffering. We are going to have people cheat on us, betray us, use us, abuse us. This world has suffering, but Jesus says, it says in Revelation, but in heaven, there is no more weeping, no more pain, no more sadness, no more suffering. I know that's somewhere I want to go. Do you want to go there too? Amen. Amen. You guys, guess what? God wants to spend all eternity with you in heaven, but you know who doesn't? The devil. The devil wants to see you fail. The devil wants to see you in a cycle of bondage, a cycle of sin, a cycle of shame. And some of you in this room right now, you're dealing with shame. And you know how people say, they say the things like, shame on you? Like, shame on you. Well, I want to just declare in the name of Jesus, shame off you in the name of Jesus. Shame off of you. Amen? Because I want to tell you, this all starts when we're little kids. I have four children, seven and a half, six and a half, four and two. And my little kids, every time kids get in trouble, there's an unspoken thing that happens. We feel shamed. And I remember my second child is a sweet little girl. She's a curly redhead child. And yeah, all the redheads, what, what? They do have souls, people, I promise. Okay, all the redheads have souls. <laughs> People are like, redheads don't have souls. They don't. We just had to baptize our kid twice. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. So my little redhead had quite a temper. She's a very sensitive child. Like some of you, you feel very deeply, right? You're deep feelers. And my first kid, she's a very like outgoing child. And you know, when she would get in timeout, it wasn't a big deal. She was just like, oh, okay. My second child, if she got in trouble, she would feel it very deeply. And she would go and kick and scream in her room. And she would do this. She, her tantrums were crazy. And one day, I went in her room, and I sat down next to her. Her name's Zaylee. She's named after the mama of St. Therese of Lisieux, Zaylee, St. Zaylee. And I sat down next to Zaylee, and I said, Zaylee, why do I love you? And my children have all been taught to say, because I'm your daughter, because I'm your son. You know, I want my children to know that I love them, not because of their achievements or because of what they do. I want my children to know them because of who they are. They are my daughter and they are my son. Amen? I know some of you right now, you feel like your parent or parents only love you when you're achieving. My mom or dad, they only love me when I'm doing well in school. My mom or dad, they only like, they're only there with me or support me when I'm on the soccer field doing well. They don't really like to be around me. They just like me when I'm achieving something, doing my piano recital, doing this, this, and this. Some of you feel that. And I want my children to know that I don't love them because they're doing good things and they're achieving. I want them to know that I love them because of who they are and because they are my daughter or my son. So I said, Zaylee, why do I love you? She goes, because I'm your daughter. I'm like, that's right. Now I said, Zaylee, do I love you even when you do bad things? And she goes, huh. She didn't know. I said, Zaylee, I love you even when you do bad things. Now, do I want you to do good things? Yeah. But I still love you even when you do bad things. And she went like this. She went, and you know what? Her tantrums weren't ever as bad. Because she felt like when she got in trouble that mommy and daddy didn't love her anymore. And I was like, oh my gosh. You know that parents are supposed to be the first people who teach you about God's love? There are a lot of Catholics who think 
that God's love is conditional. There are a lot of Catholics out there who think that you can earn God's love and you can lose God's love. There are a lot of Catholics who think that God loves them when they're in front of adoration, but when they're on in front of a computer looking at porn, God stops loving them. Is that true? No. Do you know that God loves you just as much as when you're in front of adoration looking at Jesus and the monsters as he does when you're looking at, at your phone, looking at porn on your phone? You know why? Because you can't earn God's love and you can't lose God's love. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 5 that God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But you know what? The devil doesn't want you to know that. So you know what the devil does? Because the devil is a liar and the devil sucks. He's a bully, okay? The devil does this is that because of how we are raised and how we grow up and maybe the wounds that we have in our lives, what we do is we start believing certain things. So for instance, I'm just going to go, there's something called the seven deadly wounds. And I want you to just think in your heart, maybe if some of these apply to you. And the thing is, why do we even sin? You guys, we sin because we don't remember God's love. We don't remember who we are, that we are supposed to be secure in God's love. Guess what? If you are secure in God's love, you don't sin. When you remember who you are and what you are made for, you don't sin. But guess what? We have very short memories here on earth. I have a very short memory too. I forget all the time who I am and what I'm made for. And that's why I sin. And you know why I sin? Because it feels good. Obviously, we wouldn't sin if it didn't feel good. And also because I am wounded and I have wounds that run deep. And we all do. So I'm going to go through these seven deadly wounds and sometimes the thoughts that happen. And, and so just think, do I, do I have this? One of the wounds is abandonment. And when you have been wounded, if you have ever been abandoned, maybe abandoned by a father, a mother, maybe a friend, maybe you start believing, I'm all alone and no one cares or understands. Another wound is fear. And this is the the theme of the weekend is fearless. But if we are afraid, you start believing, I am afraid. If I trust anybody, I will hurt or I will die. And so we say, we start making vows like, I will never be hurt again because I'm afraid somebody's going to hurt me. Maybe some of you feel powerless. That's another wound. And if you feel powerless, Maybe some of you have experienced abuse and you feel powerless. Maybe some of you have been bullied and you feel powerless. And sometimes the, the, the beliefs that come from this is I can't change it. I'm too small or weak. Some of you feel hopeless and you think things will never get better. I want to die. Some of you feel confused. Maybe if your parents got divorced, you, were very con- you felt very confused and you thought, I don't understand what's happening. Maybe if somebody rejected you or broke up with you, you said, I don't know what's happening. I don't know why they broke up with me, which leads to the next wound, which is rejection. And you think, I am not loved or wanted or desired. When you've been rejected and you have a wound of rejection, you feel that way. Like, nobody loves me. I'm not desired. I'm not wanted. And the next one is shame. And you think, I am bad, dirty, shameful, stupid, and worthless. And the problem is the cycle happens over and over. You have this wound and you start believing these things like I am stupid, I am worthless, I am nothing. And then what happens? You're tempted by sin. Let's take pornography for instance. Guess what? In pornography, no one can reject you. So when we have serious rejection wounds, a lot of times people will go to porn to make them feel better. To, to, to try to comfort them in that wound of rejection. So they go to porn, they're like, in porn, no one can reject me. You're not thinking this consciously. And then guess what? After you look at porn, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And you feel more shame and the cycle continues, continues. Now, if you go to confession, that's an amazing, sa- amazing sacrament of grace and we need the grace, but I wanna, I wanna ask you something right here. If I have an apple tree and I pick off the apple, what's gonna happen? It's going to regrow, right? Another apple is going to come, right? If I keep picking off the fruit, if I go to confession and I confess the sin of pornography, that's wonderful. We need those graces to help us be stronger. But the problem is if I never identify, if I really want to get rid of all that fruit of that sin, if I pick off all the apples of that tree, what's going to happen? They're all going to grow back. So what do I need to do to that tree? I need to not just cut it. I need to dig the whole thing up and throw it out. Those of you who are struggling with sins that you do over and over and over again, I want you to ask why. Why do you keep going to the hookup? 
Why do you keep going to pornography? Is it because you feel abandoned and you feel like crap and you're like, oh, I just want to feel, I just want to forget life for a moment and I want to live in virtual reality. Is that why? Is it because you feel hopeless? Is it because you feel confused? Why do we go to our sin? You know what? When I gossip, I know why I do it. Because I'm like, oh, it makes me feel better about myself. Because I've been rejected a lot. And I want to make myself feel better. That's why I do it. And I want you guys to start asking the questions, why? Every time you sin, I want you to go to confession. But I also want you to ask the question, why? Why do I do this? Why do I keep going back to this sin? And I also, we're going to take the next few moments. And we're going to ask the Lord to heal us from these sins, these wounds. And so I invite you just with me to open your hands on your lap. 